Hi guys, welcome back to the Beyond Football podcast. Today I got my first female footballer on the podcast. She's Crystal Palace under 23's captain, a real advocate for the women's game, Rio Rosenberg. So thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, I'm thank really- you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm really uh, just grateful that I'm the first one because uh, I know you're growing. Um, I just want to say thank you on my part because you're putting the spotlight to the women's game. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and I know you're very, you're having a very successful career yourself. So it's good to, to have a chat and catch up. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, man. I'm, I'm really excited and I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to get, like, get you on this because people really need to hear your, hear your stories, just see your journey. So yeah, man, let's go all the way to the start. Like, a lot of people, they know all about how like, boys and men, how they start, how they begin, like, they get scouted when they're younger, but not many people know about um, how the girls game works, like how women start playing football and everything. So mm-hmm. how did it all start for you? Yeah, taking me way back. Um, so it all really started when I was probably as soon as I could walk really. Um, my mum's a huge fan of football. My whole family loves football. Um, they're based in Scotland, so football mad family really. And I was kind of just brought up in that environment. Um, took me to the park every single day uh, with my Manchester United football. I'm a Man U fan. <laughs> um, yeah. I have to spud you for that one. <laughs> I'm a Man U fan as well. Good, good. Um, yeah, so it really just started in, in the park in Highbury and that's where it all began. I just fell in love with the game. Uh, it just brought me so much joy. I, I know you sure you get that feeling as well. I'm yeah, just so definitely. happy. It's so weird because when you think about it, it's just like this this ball, but it gives me so much love. So, yeah, uh, just that's how it all started, really. So around what age were you around then? Uh, yeah, I'd probably say five. Uh, started early. off pretty young. Yeah, early, early. Good, man. That's quite young. I think I started yeah. off playing around seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say like playing properly, but I mm. knew around five years old was, I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. that's good, man. So how did it, how was it from then? So when you were five, were you playing for a local team or just just for fun? Yeah, so this is the the difference with the men's game and the the women's game obviously now is on the rise and I'm so grateful for that but when I was growing up there wasn't really access to to all girls clubs um Mm. and I know there was there's literally a picture just behind the the zoom call but um it's just me in the park and there was a few boys and I think this coach was just running their session and that's how it really all began if I look from I was really grateful so I grew up in uh, Islington and there was a coach called Kirsty Peelin. Um, she was Arsenal captain um, mm. and won an FA Cup and to have that role model for so young at that age um, I was really lucky and she had a an all-girls club going on so I rocked up <laughs> um, and then that's how it all began and I was probably in that team for about 10 years. I loved it there. Wow, yeah, that's, yeah. that's sick. Yeah, I just loved it and I had um, trials to go for like Tottenham and I got in, but I just loved it at this grassroots club and I just wanted to stay there because at that age, it was just really the love of the game and it was where I was most happiest. Mm. And I think a lot of people forget like about the environment, it's so important, especially when you're growing up. Um, And yeah, there was, I faced a lot of obstacles and barriers when growing up in school, I was the only girl playing football. I, I remember I used to play Wembley with the boys every single lunchtime. <laughs> that that's was my the, lunchtime That's the, like, the barriers to participation that we were talking about on Clubhouse yeah. the day. Like, there needs to be more, um, obviously, um, local teams for girls when they're younger and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something that I'm really pushing for because when I look at when I was younger, um, I could have gave up really easily because the amount of people that told me that I can't play football just Mm. me kicking the ball they'll be like oh girls can't play football but then I'll have to prove it I'll nutmeg them or score a goal and I'll be like yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's like in secondary school as well I still got it probably worse than what I did in primary school but I just Mm. got on with it 
and it didn't they probably didn't like me going out at lunchtime but i was there if they weren't <laughs> the ball, I, nah, was gonna I can, just, I can just i can just imagine the guys they just they don't want to get nutmeg yeah. by a girl and then <laughs> girls can actually play that like. they can mm -hmm. actually play and it's good that you're doing that man yeah no nah, so you stayed at that local team for 10 years so when did you well, during those 10 years, like, what struggles did you go through? Like? Yeah, I think just looking back, I really enjoyed it. And I don't think there was a lot of um, like challenges that I really faced because I was just loving the game, really. Um, but again, like just touching on those stories, for me, it was more about the, the outside things. Even my parents are always supportive of me, but maybe people in the school environment saying like, football's not really a career for girls and mm. I, I remember I got um so moving from the grassroots I went to a, a different club called Alexander Park uh for I think it was two seasons I think this was from like 14 to 16 um mm. and I was kind of testing it out and seeing if I could progress my career but it was still a grassroots club um and I think it was in year 12 so I was still at my school. I decided to stay at my school. I didn't realise that there was football college programmes. Mm. Um, so I was playing uh, in Hackney Marshes um, at a tournament and I got spotted by uh, Molly and Rosie Kamisa. And from there, my football career just took off and it was so unexpected. Yeah, that's um, crazy. So what? Yeah. Um, so you basically, basically got scouted in year 12 to so when you're like, 16, 17. Yeah, it's really late. So that's, again, that's, that's the difference the, between the men's game. Yeah. 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 So with like boys, I know that you guys probably have to be in the academy clubs that at least have a small chance at like probably from the age of like 10 or something. Yeah, but it's mad because obviously I, I got into the system quite late, to be honest, because I, mm -hmm. I got scouted when I was around 12, 13. So I was out for me. That's, that's <laughs> for, for a guy. Yeah. That's, <laughs> That's really, really late. Yeah. Um, so that's the major difference between obviously the, the girls' game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel, like um, that, I feel like that in itself, I feel like that's what um maybe it creates resilience. Because obviously, since you haven't experienced that from young, you're mm -hmm. just pushing to get better and just reach that top level. Yeah, I'm for me, I'm really grateful because I look at um, I wouldn't change my journey in any way. I think every, everything happens for a reason, right? And I'm really glad that I faced a lot of ups and downs. I didn't get success straight away in my career. And it's helped me because there's still chances of getting released and all these other pressures. But because I went through the grassroots kind of journey, I knew that you're going to face obstacles. Um, mm. So I'm kind of grateful that I kind of got picked up later on because it's yeah. taught me a lot. Yeah. That's a that's um so I was speaking to one of my other teammates the other day. So we were just talking about that. Playing Sunday league, playing grassroots, it, it makes you stronger, it makes you more able to obviously deal with the struggles. Because mm -hmm. people who people say that are usually like those guys who've been at the academies from young, you know, from like the age of six to seven, they they struggle to like get past or make it to the top level, like once they reach like 16, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. For like, yeah, the the grassroots it really creates resilient players yeah and you think about like um i think this was brought up on clubhouse like what is you, the reason why you got started like what is your why um and mm. i feel like a lot of grassroots players if you come from grassroots and then get into an academy you're so grateful because i saw a quote the other day and it was kind of me reflecting if i told myself maybe three or four years ago that i'd be at crystal palace and in my first match, I'd be named captain. I'll be like, yeah, you're having me on. Like, I would never believe yeah, it. Yeah, word. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. Um, but again, it's just something that I'm so grateful for. And it just shows you that if you keep on working hard, endless possibilities, really. Yeah, literally, man. Mm. It's been, yeah. I feel like it just, it, it means that you're not complacent with it. You just take, you don't take it for granted, man. But how, yeah, how does the, no, go ahead. No, I think just on that point, um, I think a really like humble and just grateful for where I am. Um, Cause I know a lot of people might make it in academies from younger on and they don't really understand like failure. And when they hit failure, they don't know how to react. So 
I'm just yeah. grateful to be in the position that I'm in. Yeah, that's good, man. How how does the women's game, like the grassroots, how does it differ to the boys' game? Like, do you guys have Sunday leagues? You guys play on a Sunday, train every day, or how does it work? <laughs> yeah, so grassroots is just funny to look back on. Like, um, we played. It was Saturday we played, and I think we trained like maybe once or twice a week, but it was only for an hour. And this is like another thing to address in the grassroots game is kind of like the the facilities available and the access because a lot of the time if it started to rain and it was on grass the game is cancelled yeah <laughs> trust um so like there's there was majority of weeks that i might have never had training and just turn up on the match day hey, wow. and i think that's the biggest difference and then now i look at my training schedule now compared to even two years ago I went from training like once a week with a team to now, because I'm at a college um, program as well, I train five times a week, two matches, and mm, some days mm, four mm. hours. So I have no off days anymore. <laughs> that is serious, man. How How is that though? That's serious. That The lifestyle is serious. So how do you manage with that co college program and everything? I love it because football, I'm just happiest when the ball's at my feet, no matter what. Um, obviously, there's some days where I might be done at college training and then I've got to travel two hours to get to Palace training to eight to ten. And it's, it's a hard one. Because, <laughs> That's the journey yeah. that people don't see, man. Exactly. Um, people don't see like, it when you're, when you're on the TV. They don't see <laughs> <those. laughs> Yeah, they don't understand the, the commitment and the sacrifice because... I think a sacrifice is another big thing. I don't think people really understand that, especially at our age, there's a lot of distractions. It could be parties, whatever. On a Saturday night, I'll be like, I've got a game tomorrow. I need to prepare. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifice um, that, <laughs> that you do. And sometimes I look at it and look at my schedule and be like, yeah, I've sacrificed a lot. <laughs> I'm happy. So yeah, there no, it's go. good. I feel like that's the, that's the beauty of it. That's all part of the story, isn't it? Mm. so you know so how does the college program actually work so is it what education do you do with it yeah so i'm at um level seven academy it used to be called edsv i don't know if you've heard of it um but it's a really ex successful college program and really for it's about creating an equal playing field for boys and girls so we get the same opportunities um I think the success for the, the boys and the girls, there's so much success. I think there's about 50 plus signing like semi-pro from the boys and the girls. So I think we have That's so equal, good, man. Yeah, equal amount of success and we will celebrate it. Um, I remember when I made my debut for the academy, all the boys uh, were in the stands like cheering us on. And I think I've never had that environment where boys were encouraging it. And I was like, finally. Um, that, is, was, that is beautiful, man. Yeah. That's um, all you want. Exactly. Um, and then with the, it's kind of just like a normal college, but they work around your football schedule. And that's something that I was really grateful for because I was in just a normal school sixth form and they didn't understand the commitment, the football. And then I got put into an environment where they work around your football schedule and they understand. So if you need extended deadlines, they'd understand I came in late for, from Palace training, right? She just needs to catch up a bit more in lessons. Mm -hmm. today. Um, and I currently do a B Tech Sport um, and getting that currently. So yeah, I'm just I, I love the academy. I just think the whole setup is brilliant, and it's like a family. The coaches, like some of my coaches, um, Sophie Harris, Leicester City woman, first team, Lee Nicol, Crystal Palace, first team. So, so you've got experienced really coaches. Their levels higher. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. And then cool. also like the men at the academy as well. Um, Ian Hart, uh, James Marzi, I think he was at Brighton, Crystal Palace, um, Lee Hayes, like like so many coaches, there's so many of them, but they've all got so such big experience in the game and probably some of the best coaches in the country. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, man. Mm -hmm. I feel like the the way there's that um, college program in this day and age, it shows that we're making progress. It shows yeah. that obviously there's changes making and that there's equal opportunities for girls to obviously have a career in the game. I feel like as well, the way they um, obviously manage your football and education, I feel like that's 
that's so that's good. A big help, trust me. A big, <laughs> big help. Because there's a lot yeah. of clubs that we were talking about, a lot of clubs, I mean, um, a lot of um, schools, they don't really like to help their players sometimes, but there is some that do, but it's obviously rare. They might not understand it. They want you to focus on education. But, mm-hmm. So the fact that they have that is, that's excellent, man. Yeah. I'm just really grateful for it because I remember in uh, the other sixth form, I was struggling because mm. I couldn't get my work done because obviously I had other commitments and they just didn't understand it. And they were like, why, as a female as well, why are you putting so much time and effort in something that you're not going to be successful in? So yeah. I'm just grateful because now I look back at it and be like, look where I am now. It's paid mm. off. So it's exactly. one of those. They can't, they can't say nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> they just come and beg it. Exactly. <laughs> no, nah, it's mad. So how did, it, um, how did you come about being on the um, BT Sport Ultimate Goal? The series because I, I watched a bit of it and it was actually really good yeah um that was that that was like mad <laughs> um because I think it was in August I saw on Instagram they were promoting it and I, I realized the the minimum age was 18 I was like you know what I'll just apply I, I yeah. did not expect anything because you know when when it comes to tv shows thousands of people apply and yeah. then the producer got back to me I was like oh surely they're just emailing everyone and they asked me a bit about my story so I sent it in um and then they called me I think it was a week later and they were like pack your bags you're going to St George's <laughs> next week I was like what it was right. um yeah that was crazy and then on BT Sport um that week that whole week was just a crazy experience and something that I'll never forget like um, I had master classes from Rio Ferdinand and Farrah Williams, um, and I was just like, yeah, <laughs> it was. Like it, I was kind of speechless when they came out, and I'm just so grateful. It just shows you like where I was just like a year ago, and then now I'm at St George's Park and I'm competing with the best of the best. I was like, this is, <laughs> it's incredible, really. Yeah. yeah. No, that's crazy. When I when I was watching it, it really it really touched me because it really showed me like the woman's woman's side of the game. Mm-hmm. That, that there's actually people that are obviously same age as me, but maybe they don't have the same opportunity as me. But obviously they're still pushing and they still have that same love of the game. And just hearing your story was yeah, it really touched me when I was watching that on your Instagram, man. <laughs> yeah, that was um <laughs> it was difficult. It was difficult because when when I was watching on TV obviously when I was doing the interview we had like this obviously you don't see what's behind the camera so there's like three cameramen the sound people and the the person asking the questions and to open up about it in front of a camera is so difficult like people don't understand mm. but when you put in the situation yeah, no, that's then, brave man that's brave. yeah it was, it was tough but I'm really glad I did it um because I kind of I never opened up about that side of my story before and I'm really glad I did and I, the response I got from the show and the, the, uh, the support I got from my college program as well was just unbelievable um and I think I inspired quite a lot of people so I'm just grateful that I opened up about it but it was definitely hard to do <laughs> yeah no it's hard to, it was but well, I'm so grateful that you did as well because I feel like that's that's what people need to hear. The, mm-hmm. the obviously the dark side of it, of the journey, the experience of upcoming footballers. That it's actually we actually go through a lot of behind the scenes. Like it's not all fun and games. <laughs> so I'm, it's good, man. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so the main question I want to ask you though, um, who are you beyond football? See so when outside, you outside, outside the game. <laughs> When you were DM me and I saw that question, I was like, it's a tough one because mm. my life revolves around football. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. if I think about it, if I'm not playing it, I'm watching it or I'm talking about it. Um, so I feel like, yeah, I was thinking about it a lot, but I feel like I'm a quite uh, a family person. I really love being around my family and I'm quite caring as well. And I just love music. I love all of that sort of stuff. But uh, just sport in general, 
um, I just love and inspiring people. Again, I'm not trying not to touch on football, but yeah, football no, it's good. Man. <laughs> no, it's but, good. Um, yeah, I think that's me beyond football, but really my main purpose, um, not just in, in football, but as a female in sport, is just to inspire um, girls and boys at whatever level they're at to keep on going. Um, and I think, I don't know if you were in the conversation, but there's a lot of people that drop out at our age. Yeah. Um, and kind of figuring out how we could keep people staying active um, in sport. It could just be like a, a run or a walk because um, it's so important to stay yeah. active. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good, man. It's good. So, yeah, that's just the whole point of this podcast. Just obviously the importance of the game, but obviously stressing the importance of having that identity beyond it. Yeah, it's a hard one, though, because... It is, it is. Because that's again, literally... The response, the response you gave me is literally the response most people had when, <laughs> when I asked them that question. But obviously, it's something that we need to raise awareness of. Yeah, because I think it's more about building an identity like away from your sport um exactly because if you look at like social media for example a lot of my page is football because that is me but like see when i'm injured like what i'm going through right now i've yeah. started to think about other stuff off the pitch that i could do and it's it's making me think what can i do beyond football because eventually we all retire at one point exactly. and that's <laughs> and we'll the that's the that important anyway. thing yeah um but really good question by the way because <laughs> it got me thinking <laughs> good man but uh, yeah like that's when I think about it because just seeing like just um, my teammates just how people just um react to the game of football like they I feel like sometimes they just they let it consume them too much and then when it's taken away from them it really affects them so that's the aim of this just to obviously show that it's it's important to have it because obviously yeah. imagine going now since you you started you started at the age of five, so imagine mm -hmm. going from all those years now, 10, 12, 13 years in the game of football, every week training five times a week, playing games, and mm -hmm. that's all you do. Like, and then maybe you get released, and there's it's all taken away from you. Mm -hmm. I feel like being having an identity beyond football will give people a, another thing to fall back on or to bounce back off of. Yeah, it's really important because if you think about lockdown right now, everything's been taken away from us this last year. God knows how we went through it, but exactly, I yeah. think it's changed everyone. I think it's made people uh, ask that question um, because if you think about it, we went from training 24-7 to, mm. to, to nothing and you're kind of figuring out what you're going to do in the day. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it makes you, it makes you realise that you are wow, that we actually got there's a lot of time in the day. Exactly. <laughs> how, but going back to like the woman's side of the game, how, how hard is it to make it to the top level as a female footballer? It's, it's hard. Um, it's really difficult. It's the same like competitiveness as the, the men's game, but obviously you're just a bit ahead. Um, but I think a lot of people think, oh, yeah, I could easily get into a, a woman's team, blah, blah, blah. But they're not in, like, the game to understand it. And the yeah. amount of effort we put in, the exact same amount of training hours that the men's do. Like, if just, again, my training schedule, it's probably a lot more than what some of the boys do. Um, yeah. And I'm not getting paid for it. And I know a lot of this is another issue that needs to be tackled in the WSL and the Championship. If you look at the wage gap between, like, the Premier League or the championship, or the, even the lower leagues in the men's football, it's just a huge gap to some of the, the international players in the WSL, for example. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. It's really challenging, but um, it's the same amount of time, effort needed to reach the top level. It's the exact same thing. Um, you, guys don't, you guys don't get the same rewards for it. And I think that shows you we're still we're still willing to do all of that and not even get paid sometimes. That is um, that is so crazy because I know for a fact that a lot of guys wouldn't go through all that and not get paid, if you get what I mean. So the fact that women or, or girls are able to do that and not get paid, put their bodies through all that stress, that's I feel like that shows a lot, man. That's a real eye-opener for me. 
Mm-hmm. No, but it just shows you like how much, like the love of the game and how much we're willing to go, uh, to go through, um, just to reach the top or be a professional. Um, and it's just another that could be a different conversation for another day because it's just a. Uh, there's a lot to talk about in that space, but um, yeah, yeah, it just shows you the commitment levels in the women's game, and there's people working really hard to get the game where it is right now. So I'm just grateful for that. No, we need to keep just raising awareness because mm-hmm. I feel like stuff like this, and obviously what you're doing, inspiring other people. I feel like that's that's what we need to continue doing, obviously to raise that awareness. So mm-hmm. those um, girls, those women that are pushing hard every day. And they're not getting rewarded. Uh, that yeah, needs to change. Yeah, because just you doing this, for example, you're putting visibility and the spotlight on the women's game. And we need more people to do that because I think a lot of the time it's the females leading this conversation. If we get more males involved in the conversation mm-hmm. and willing to be in the conversation, it's going to go a lot, lot further. And we could see that people want to watch it. If you look at World Cup, 1.1 billion people tuned in for the final. Wow. That shows you that people want to watch it. No, that's <laughs> so good, it's definitely there. But I want to thank you once again because you're putting a spotlight on women's football and I'm really grateful. Um, and I know you're quite young as well. I think we're similar ages, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank <laughs> you so much. No, for, man. Thank, you, thank you so much for just being on because um, your story, as I said, your story needs to be heard. And that's my whole point And that's my aim of everything that I'm doing, man. Mm-hmm. It's really good, by the way. Um, I'm just really grateful, um, and I think the like the title "Beyond Football" is brilliant because I think everyone, again, we've all realised that life could change like that, and just be grateful for what you've got right now. And Literally. I know when I get back on that pitch, God, so you don't want to be playing me. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going exactly, all man. I know, I know exactly how you're feeling, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you once again. I've really enjoyed. Yeah. The- I don't, it's crazy. Um, not a lot of stick changing. I think there's a long way still that needs to go. Yeah, no. I feel like the fact that you guys have to pay for all of that, that is just, I feel like something needs to be done about that. Yeah, because again, because we're still in the academy, it's, I think it's different with the first team, but because we're still in the academy set up and it's like this for the different clubs and obviously because of COVID it's affected stuff but I had to to pay for that MRI and just stuff off the pitch as well that we we need help with it's just like player care really yeah Um, so is there not like because obviously we have the the PFA do the PFA not cater to women as well to help out with stuff like that I'm pretty sure but I think it's professional um, okay. I think it's different with I, I don't really know much about it but um, there still needs to a lot to be done around that aspect of like the funding because like we just touched on so if you got injured you'd probably be taken straight away to see like a, a doctor or yeah, get straight away. so when that my injury happened in November I have access to physios, which I'm really grateful for because a lot of people don't even have that access. Yeah. But I've had to wait four months, then have to go privately to get it checked out. And I think it cost me about like 200 plus just to get an MRI scan. Um, and again, I think we're paying more um, to play the game. Um, so it's another thing that needs to be addressed, but I'm just gonna That's... put the spotlight on it really. Yeah, no, it needs, the spotlight needs to be shown on it because I, I never knew that. Because I feel like that might obviously be the reason why the the women's game might not be, um, well, guys or girls might not be doing as well. Because obviously they don't have that funding and those facilities. Mm-hmm. Every guy that's in a, an academy now, if he gets injured, he has like elite, elite um, staff to help him recover in the fastest time possible. But like you girls and, and women, you guys don't have that support and something needs to change about that man. yeah 100 and hopefully they're watching the podcast and they can make a change <laughs> no definitely it's, man. it's good to have these conversations but i think what i learned from clubhouse as well is um 
stuff needs to be done at the board level because these are the people that can make the changes and put the funding into grassroots. We right. are like, we can't do much. You can't do much, man. <laughs> yeah, but we could just raise awareness on the on the subject and just do the things that we can control. Um, hopefully I can get on the board and change a few things up. <laughs> Yeah, man. One day, that's the future, man. We 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 are literally the future. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I think we're in good hands if if that's the case. So there we go. Yeah, literally. <laughs> nah, but the clubhouse. I feel like the clubhouse is really really good because obviously there's a lot of big people on there that can actually make a difference and they're actually listening. Mm -hmm. So just being on it the past week, I've connected with a lot of people in the game of football and. There's a lot of people who are ready to listen and make a change. So yeah, I think, yeah, for, the same with me because um, I never thought that I could have access to like speaking to some of the highest people in the women's game. I was like, am I really on the stage with them, like speaking? And like, actually, I think it's really good because it's finally putting a spotlight on issues, and your voice could be heard no matter who you are. It doesn't matter like what company you represent or whatever, and. If I look at the connections I've made on Clubhouse, I've had over about 200 plus DMs from me just sharing my story, uh, which is crazy. Like different um, agents, management. So it's wow. just 200 it's plus. Yeah, like wow. honestly, if the I go power, through it, the power, <laughs> the power of Clubhouse. I know. Go on wow. it if you're not Clubhouse. On it. <laughs> I'm telling you, Clubhouse. If you use it well, you can really, really do big things, man. Mm -hmm. I think but also I think people know who's genuine or not because some people go on there and they just like promote uh, maybe their business or something like that but yeah. I think the rooms that we have what we've been on where we have like really good conversations I think there's one on Wednesday about equality and inclusion in sport the yeah. conversation in that room that needs to be broadcasted everywhere because the conversation happening is unreal literally um, like what I've clocked is that wow that like the conversation, sh there should be a way to record the conversation because yeah. there's a lot, of, a lot of the times where people are saying juice, like good, good stuff, where mm -hmm. a lot of people need to hear what they're saying. Yeah. But um, yeah, Clubhouse is crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah. Network is your net worth. Exactly. There you go. I, I have heard that quote, you know. I like that quote. <laughs> nah, that's it, man. No, it's been great, man. Thank you once again. No problem. <laughs> you see, we have to keep striving, keep raising awareness because the women's game, the future of it is bright and we just have to keep pushing. What, what do you think the future of the women's game actually is going to be like? It's going to be, it's going to be big, trust me, I think, because um, something that I didn't know, and again, from Clubhouse, I think, um, in the 1950s or something like that, um, I think the women's attendance was about 50,000 and they banned it. And then, uh -huh. yeah, they banned it. They banned women from playing football and that's why the women's game is where it is now. It would probably be- Wait, what? Yeah, it, they got, they, it got banned. Um, and what, because what, they were scared that it would overtake the guys game or what? Who knows? <laughs> that could oh, have been- crazy. Reason. Um, and it's kind of taken like two or three generations to finally start to catch up. So I think that just shows you and um, the viewing numbers of the World Cup. Um, I think in 10 plus years, it's going to be a really bright, bright um, future for the women's game. And I think a lot more clubs will be pro fully professional. And what I want to see as well is the men's clubs working with the women's clubs and have just having one club as a whole not um, like putting a label on it, sharing facilities, sharing stadiums. Um, mm. because ultimately, that's how you grow exposure. Um, I think it was at the Chelsea v Tottenham in the WSL when they had it at Stamford Bridge and I think it nearly sold out. So it just shows you as soon as you put women's football in a bigger venue, people want to see it. So um, again, yeah. again, the visibility exposure, but it's a really bright future ahead and I'm really excited. Wow, I can't wait, man. And yeah. you're going to be at the forefront of that. You can see. Hopefully, it. yes. <laughs> so, yes. Um, that's what I'm pushing to do. When you're playing in that W, when you're when you're playing in that WSL, just just remember us in it. 
I'll give, I'll give you a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. You love to see it. Well, I thought, I'm pretty sure you're playing internationally, no? Yeah, I've played for England and Nigeria, yeah. Just something small on the side, so you're doing well. So hopefully, I see you. Doing well. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, man, yeah. by God's grace, man, one day the big World Cup, Premier League, man, one day lift it, Champions League, everything. <laughs> all of that, all of that. <laughs> nah, it's good. Cool, cool. That like, that's our conversation. Yeah. Done, man. Or is there anything else you wanna? Uh, I think we've covered everything. To be to be honest, if I say um, the people watching, I think the biggest thing for me is um, the women's game isn't going anywhere. It's it's on the rise. It's just taking off, really. Mm-hmm. No one's stopping it. You can't stop it. Um, and also, like the comments on social media, like no one cares. Blah blah blah. I probably read those thousands and thousands of times a day. It's not stopping us um so for any young girls watching this as well and boys keep working hard and your endless opportunity and if you don't take the risk you don't get the reward so i think that's how we can end it but thank you once again uh, (laughs) for having me on (laughs) thank you thank you very much that was brilliant words from rio rosenberg (laughs) you have to trademark that So someone's probably quoted it, to be fair.